Good flight. Hardly. Air travel just goes from bad to worse. It wasn't even a particularly cheap flight, but there was precious little legroom. It left half an hour late and I wasn't offered as much as a glass of water. Well, it was the national airline, so you always pay a bit over the odds. But there are actually fewer seats, so it shouldn't be cramped. But since the budget airline started competing, nobody's offering free refreshments on these short routes anymore. Anyway, the pilot obviously made up time. I'd only just turned up and there you were. I expect you were late too. But there's an inordinate amount of queuing up and hanging about involved in air travel. I know you're going to say that's because of security and so it's not the airline's fault. I wasn't actually. The thing to do next time is steer clear of the big hubs. You could have flown into the little airport down the coast, even with this airline. Lots less hanging about there. There's not the volume of passengers, and despite the drive, it'd still be quicker than the train. It's not this airport I'm complaining about. It's the one I've just come from. Now play the recording again. Extract 1. You hear a man talking to a friend who's just arrived at an airport. Now look at questions 1 and 2. From what I remember of science at school, it was mostly a case of listen and make notes, with the odd set-piece experiment. That's not science. I mean, all subjects are knowledge-based to a certain extent, but with the internet, kids can access information directly, without the mediation of the teacher. What they can't manage to do on their own is question it, have a critical view of its accuracy and usefulness. That's where the teacher comes in. Right. And kids need to know how to use science in real life, so these days it's all about putting information in context. Like I did a lesson last week where they worked out how much energy is expended to make, buy and watch a television. I mean, there's an immediate relevance there. So do kids everywhere do that now? Well, it would be good if they could. I worked out this scheme of work with some colleagues from other local schools. It had official backing, but only time will tell if it gets adopted on a wider scale. But we had a meeting last week to see how it was going and nobody wanted to change anything. Now play the recording again. Extract 2. You hear a science teacher telling a friend about her work. Now look at questions 3 and 4. And Fiona, you've been listening to the first album from a new band, new to me at least, called The Forerunners. Where did they come from? Well, basically, Tom, what you've got here is four young guys from rural England who debut with a record that's effectively homemade, not a studio recording. That's incredible in itself. But what really blew me away was the fact that it's unaffected in a way you'd scarcely think possible. They make a gentle sound, and even when doing crescendos, they never get harsh, never seem to fall in love with their own vibe. Added to that, they seem to use a whole range of instruments without ever drawing your attention to the fact. Yes, I agree, and they keep the interest going from one little jewel to the next. There are almost no duds here. And although there are echoes of all sorts of people, it wouldn't be fair to make comparisons. I mean, what makes them kind of unique is that they don't seem to be trying to sound like anyone but themselves. Quite highly recommended. Now play the recording again. That is the end of part one. Now turn to part two. Extract three. You hear a new album being reviewed on a music radio station. Now look at questions 5 and 6. I'm going to give you the instructions for this test. I'll introduce each part of the test and give you time to look at the questions. At the start of each piece, you will hear this sound. Remember to play each piece twice.
Now open your question paper and look at part one. You'll hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Hi there. My name's John and the topic of my presentation is an animal which originally comes from South America. It's called the llama and it's becoming an increasingly common sight in North America and Europe where it's used as a guard animal to protect flocks of domestic sheep and goats from predators. Just the presence of a llama is apparently enough to keep foxes and other predators away. And they are quite large animals, standing as tall as me but weighing a lot more. But llamas themselves are domesticated animals, closely related to another smaller animal called the alpaca. People sometimes confuse the two. Alpacas have the same long and slightly curved ears, narrow feet and thick coat, but have a different face, which is shorter. Both animals are related to wild animals, which are still found in the Andes Mountains, but whereas llamas come in a range of colours, including dark brown, black and white, and often a mixture of the three, the animal from which it is descended tends only to be light brown. This wild animal still lives high up in the mountains near the snow line, but there aren't that many of them left. Llamas were domesticated long before European settlers arrived in the Americas. Although their meat was eaten, the largest numbers worked as beasts of burden in mining districts rather than being associated with farming. Ancient pictures do show llamas pulling a plough, but they were soon replaced by the horses and mules introduced from Europe. Llamas are one of those animals that people seem to like. You hear words like docile and friendly used to describe their character, although the one that comes up most often when people talk about their character is curious. I guess that's why they've been domesticated for so long. They approached humans and seemed more useful than dangerous. Some people think that llamas, like the camels to which they are related, sometimes kick people or even spit at them, but I read that this is a sign of poor training by the humans concerned, that in a well-brought-up llama, such behaviour would be a sign that they are feeling threatened and not a sign that they feel bored or bad-tempered. Llamas are naturally very sociable animals which like to live in groups. They communicate using various noises. A gentle hum keeps them in touch with their friends and family whereas a bray like a donkey would be a warning to others in the group of impending danger. These days, llama hair is still used in the spinning and weaving industries, where it's particularly valued because it's grease-free, as well as being lightweight, warm and rather luxurious when knitted into garments. Alpaca hair tends to make the best pullovers, however, with llama being used for other things, especially rugs, but also wool hangings. And llama is quite often used to make useful things like ropes too. So, those are the basic facts about the llama. I'd now like to show you some video footage of the animal, but before I do that, does anyone have any questions? Now play the recording again. That is the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You'll hear a student called John giving a class presentation about the llama, an animal that comes originally from South America. For questions 7 to 14, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. In the exam, you have 45 seconds to look at part 2. My guest today is the young film director Lauren Cassio, whose first full-length feature film Hidden Valley Dreams has been well-received critically as well as achieving box office success. Lauren, was it always your ambition to be a filmmaker? I did media studies at college, actually, and had no great desire to go into filmmaking when I started. As part of the course, I made some short films, and on the strength of that, some of the staff suggested I went in that direction. I mean, they were extremely short three-minute films, but they seemed to see some promise and encouraged me. I wasn't doing anything groundbreaking, but the fact that I was able to put images together and tell a story in a very economical way time-wise was something I think they responded to and wanted me to pursue. So after finishing that course, I enrolled in film school where I could concentrate on that. I've heard some people saying film school's a waste of time, don't bother with it. What do you feel about that? There's young people coming into filmmaking from commercials, videos and television saying that. But what works for one person may not work for another, so perhaps they don't need it. 
I had no family connections in the business and no private means, so for me, being in an environment where the equipment was available and the help was freely given, that opened doors. The fact that people I was at school with are now making their way in the film world is also testimony to its value. But I'm not saying it's the only route. But it's taken you a long time to get from your first shorts to your first full-length feature film, hasn't it? That was no accident, really. I went through a process of making shorter films so that I could acquire some skills. A lot of people get out of school, make one film and want to make that leap into feature films. But invariably, they fall flat on their faces. Maybe some of them are ready to make the leap earlier. I knew I wasn't. I wasn't prepared to squander time and money doing something I hadn't yet got the experience and expertise to carry off. I wasn't short of offers, even financially attractive ones, but it wasn't the right moment. I think your women characters are very good, but I think your men characters are incredible. Thanks. But with all characters, trying to find some dimension in them is very important to me, whatever the gender. Certainly we see a lot of stereotypes in films, men and women, look alike representations of a certain common perception. I've always wanted to create characters with a bit more to them than that, people with depth that might allow an audience to see a different side to their characters, but not by making them behave in unnatural ways. That just confuses the audience. So my male characters are macho, sure, but there's got to be a vulnerability there. That's been a very conscious thing, and even the villains need to have a conscience. So what about Hidden Valley Dreams? Well, though I can't deny that I'm proud of it, there's a lot of things I'd change if I were to make that film again. I remember sitting one afternoon and just writing it, the storyline, in about four or five hours. It seemed to be something that needed to come out. Writing for me has never been that easy since. Perhaps it was a dumb idea for me to go out and make a 1940s period film as my debut because the resources and the control I had over the environment, the logistics, were very limited. I tried a bunch of things, a social theme, but a story with a sense of humour. I just had a gut feeling that it would appeal, and it worked, but don't ask me how. And would you encourage kids who'd like to get into filmmaking? Why not? Actually, I get invited to talk occasionally at high schools. Although I have mixed feelings about the whole notion of being someone to look up to, of being a role model, I think it's important for kids to see that the things that they're aspiring to are doable, that we're not giving them false dreams. If through some conversation with myself or anyone else who's worked hard to get where they are, they can identify with the fact that I'm just some kid from an ordinary background like them, then that's cool. I can't pretend I'll ever be a real superhero to those young people, but I try to do what I can. Thank you, Laurent. We have to leave it there. Now play the recording again. That is the end of part three. Now turn to part four. You'll hear an interview with a young film director, Lauren Cassio, who is talking about her life and work. For questions 15 to 20, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. In the exam, you have 70 seconds to look at part three. Speaker one. I'm not particularly keen on flying, so when I toured Australia with a friend, we ended up taking a lot of long-distance trains. To keep within our tight budget, we'd catch night trains at unearthly hours to avoid the expense of booking into hotels. So it was that we found ourselves dropping off to sleep at a station in the outback, waiting for the early morning train to Sydney. Obviously, I'd never have done it if I'd been travelling alone, because I'd have felt at risk, but it seemed a safe enough place, and very clean. Anyway... There wasn't much going on there, so at least it made the night go quickly. Speaker 2 I was working on a global product launch for my company with reps attending from all over the world, so it had to run smoothly, quite stressful. Uh, part of the event involved arranging corporate hospitality, and one option was having a foot massage. After all my hard work, I decided to have one too, and then dozed off in the chair halfway through. Luckily, they let me sleep while they finished the other guests. It should have been refreshing, but having slept sitting up, I woke up with a stiff neck, and the pain lasted several days. I must have been exhausted, though. Speaker 3 I was in a long-distance yacht race, a personal challenge for me. Uh, we'd sailed nine days non-stop, all the time rushing around on deck, so as soon as we'd pulled into a harbour and moored up, we were so desperately tired that we got our heads down right there on deck for some sleep. Bliss! But we awoke later to the sight of a huge, smelly vessel moored up beside us. 
and we quickly realised to our horror that our sleeping bags were damp from exposure to salt spray. It said something about the state we were in that we were mistaken for the crew of the ship next door. Speaker 4 I just finished university and had gone to visit some old friends. I remember one evening we went to see one of our favourite bands performing. I knew it would be a long night of dancing and generally being on my feet, but for some reason I was already flagging soon after we arrived, so I thought I'd better take a rest. And I actually managed to fall asleep on top of one of the speakers. Goodness knows how. Anyway, I rather expected my friends would find it highly amusing, but in fact they were quite sniffy and a bit embarrassed. So I've decided they're just not my friends anymore. Speaker 5 My friends live out by quite a remote beach. Since we hadn't seen each other for ages, we sat on the sands and talked until late. Then we lit a fire, and as the last bus had already left and we were some distance from the nearest town, and no one could be bothered to move anyway, we just all fell asleep right there. The next morning, they told me people living there often did that weekends, so I felt good that I'd had the chance to join in. It made me wish I could do the same where I live. Not very likely in my cold, windblown town, though. Now play the recording again. That is the end of the test. Part 4 consists of two tasks. You'll hear five short extracts in which people are talking about falling asleep in a public place. Look at task 1. For questions 21 to 25, choose from the list A to H the reason each gives for falling asleep in the place they did. Now look at task 2. For questions 26 to 30, choose from the list A to H how each speaker felt afterwards. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. In the exam, you have 45 seconds to look at part four.